month and no board to pay. And I did long to stand behind a wheel again and never roam any more. But I had been making such an ass of myself lately in grandiloquent letters home about my blind lead and my European excursion that I did what many and many a poor disappointed miner had done before, said, It is all over with me now and I will never go back home to be pitied and snubbed. I had been a private secretary, a silver miner, and a silver mill operative, and amounted to less than nothing in each, and now, what to do next? I yielded to Higby's appeals and consented to try the mining once more. We, cl we climbed far up on the mountainside and went to work on a little rubbishy claim of ours that had a shaft on it, eight feet deep. Higby descended into it and worked bravely with his pick till he had loosened up a deal of rock and dirt, and then I went down with a long-handled shovel, the most awkward invention yet contrived by man, to throw it out. You must brace the shovel forward with the side of your knee till it is full, and then with a skillful toss throw it backward over your shoulder. I made the toss and landed the mess just on the edge of the shaft. It all came back on my head and down the back of my neck. I never said a word but climbed out and walked home. I inwardly resolved that I would starve before I would make a target of myself and shoot rubbish at it with a long handled shovel. I sat down in the cabin and gave myself up to solid misery, so to speak. Now in pleasanter days I had amused myself with writing letters to the chief paper of the territory, the Virginia Daily Territorial Enterprise, and had always been surprised when they appeared in print. My good opinion of the editors had steadily declined, for it seemed to me that they might have found something better to fill up with than my literature. I had found a letter in the post office as I came home from the hillside, and finally I opened it. Eureka! I never did know what Eureka meant, but it seems to be as proper a word to heave in as any when no other that sounds pretty offers. It was a deliberate offer to me of $25 a week to come up to Virginia and be city editor of the Enterprise. I would have challenged the publisher in the blind lead days. I wanted to fall down and worship him now. $25 a week. It looked like bloated luxury, a fortune, a sinful and lavish waste of money. But my transports cooled when I thought of my inexperience and consequent unfitness for the position. And straightway, to, on top of this, my long array of failures rose up before me. Yet if I refuse this place, I must presently become dependent upon somebody for my bread, a thing necessarily distasteful to a man who had never experienced such a humiliation since he was thirteen years old. Not much to be proud of, since it is so common, but then it was all I had to be proud of, so I was scared into being a city editor. I would have declined otherwise. Necessity is the mother of taking chances. I do not doubt that if, at that time, I had been offered a salary to translate the Talmud from the original Hebrew, I would have accepted, albeit with, diff with diffidence and some misgivings, and thrown as much variety into it as I could for the money. I went up to Virginia and entered upon my new vocation. I was a rusty-looking city editor. I am free to confess, coatless, slouch hat, blue woolen shirt, pantaloons stuffed into boot tops, whiskered half down to the waist, and the universal navy revolver slung to my belt. But I secured a more Christian costume and discarded the revolver. I had never had an occasion to kill anybody, nor ever felt a desire to do so, but had worn the thing in deference to popular sentiment and in order that I might not, by its absence, be offensively conspicuous and a subject of remark. But the other editors and all the printers carried revolvers. I asked the chief editor and proprietor, Mr. Goodman I will call him since it describes him as well as any name could do, for some instructions with regard to my duties. And he told me to go all over town and ask all sorts of people all sorts of questions 
Make notes of the information gained and write them out for publication. And he added, never say, we learned so and so, or it is reported, or it is rumored, or we understand so and so, but go to headquarters and get the absolute facts, and then speak out and say, it is so and so. Otherwise, people will not put confidence in your news. Unassailable certainty is a thing that gives a newspaper the firmest and most valuable reputation. It was the whole thing in a nutshell, and to this day, when I find a reporter commencing his article with, we understand, I gather a suspicion that he has not taken as much pains to inform himself as he ought to have done. I moralize well, but I did not always practice well when I was a city editor. I let fancy get the upper hand of fact too often when there was a dearth of news. I can never forget my first day's experience as a reporter. I wandered about town questioning everybody, boring everybody, and finding out that nobody knew anything. At the end of five hours, my notebook was still barren. I spoke to Mr. Goodman. He said, Dan used to make a good thing out of the hay wagons in a dry time when there were no fires or inquests. Are there no hay wagons in from Truckee? From the Truckee? If there are, you might speak of the renewed activity and all that sort of thing in the hay business, you know. It isn't sensational or exciting, but it fills up and looks businesslike. I canvassed the city again and found one wretched old hay truck dragging in from the, count, from the country. But I made affluent use of it. I multiplied it by 16, brought it into town from 16 different directions made 16 separate items out of it, and got up such another sweat about hay as Virginia City had never seen in the world before. This is encouraging. Two non parallel columns had to be filed, filled, and I was getting along. Presently, when things began to look dismal again, a desperado killed a man in a saloon and joy returned once more. I never was so glad over any mere trifle before in my life. I said to the murderer, Sir, you are a stranger to me, but you have done me a kindness this day, which I can never forget. If whole years of gratitude can be to you any slight compensation, they shall be yours. I was in trouble, and you have relieved me nobly, and at a time when all seemed dark and drear. Count me your friend from this time forth, for I am not a man to forget a favor. If I, if I did not really say that to him, I at least felt a sort of itching desire to do it. I wrote up the murder with a hungry attention to details, and when it was finished, experienced but one regret, namely that they had not hanged my benefactor on the spot so that I could work him up too. Next, I discovered some immigrant wagons going into camp on the plaza and found that they had lately come through the hostile Indian country and had fared rather roughly. I made the best of the item that the circumstances permitted, and felt that if I were not confined within rigid limits by the presence of the reporters of the other papers, I could add particulars that would make the article much more interesting. However, I found one wagon that was going on to California, and made some judicious inquiries of the proprietor. When I learned through his short and surly answers to my cross-questioning that he was certainly going on and would not be in the city next day to make trouble, I got ahead of the other papers, for I took down his list of names and added his party to be killed and wounded. Having more scope here, I put this wagon through an Indian fight that to this day has no parallel in history. My two columns were filled. When I read them over in the morning, I felt that I had found my legitimate occupation at last. I reasoned within myself that news, and stirring news, too, was what a paper needed and I felt that I was peculiarly endowed with the ability to furnish it. Mr. Goodman said that I was a, as good a reporter as Dan. I desired no higher commendation. With encouragement like that, I felt that I could take my pen and murder all the immigrants on the plains if need be, and the interests of the paper demanded it. Chapter 43 My Friend Bob the school report. 
Boggs pays me an old debt. Virginia City.